Hello, everyone. I'd like to officially welcome you to Harness the Power of Smart Notes, Building Your Research and Educational Brain. My name is Shelley Haydock, and I'm co-hosting today's session with Matt Caton, our Director of Customer Solutions. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. If you tuned in a little bit early, you heard Shelley and I talking about the vast number of different brain examples we're going to be sharing with you today. No two people's research is, is ever going to be alike. So we've got a lot of different samples to give you ideas of how you can get your data into the brain to give you better insight. That's right. And uh, one of the interesting things about organizing the brain for research and education is the magic and, and power of seeing all your knowledge come together with the visual connections. So we're going to be talking a lot about smart notes, but one of the great things about the brain is that ability to take your note and make that connection. And whether your note is a topic or a thought or a long list of items and bring the knowledge to get to, together in a way that really reflects your thinking and facilitates sort of that discovery and excitement of the information. Um, a lot of um, research teams talk about when they start a brain together, how exciting it becomes to look at their ideas rather than just trading messages and having like a folder of documents. Um, there's a lot of different modalities in the brain to really express your creativity connect ideas and really learn from the content and also to make learning fun uh, for those of you that are uh, teaching large classrooms and things like that. So with that, I'm going to start and just give you a tour of a few different brains. This is my teaching and learning brain. Uh, but before we go there, I'm actually going to also show you my writer's brain. So you can actually have sort of the one brain for many different topics or you can have multiple brains. So in this particular brain, um, I've got my elements of story. I've got an area on my writer's projects where I can go in and look at story development. And one of the advantages of the brain is that one piece of information effectively connects to multiple other areas. So if I want to link my online product brochure to um, maybe uh, something else in my brain related to a project called uh, the Blue Rose story that I'm working on because there's some shared content. I can make that connection. And now this particular document is going to live under multiple categories. And that takes me back up to fiction, which is part of my writing projects in my brain. So when I click on any thought, um, what it does is it brings that thought to the center of the screen and it displays all related thoughts around that. So I can continue to see any relevant connections. And in the content area, I also have uh, different notes that I can take or I can see links to different web pages as well. So I can visually navigate across content sources and, and sort of maintain that seamless view of all my information. So you can have a variety of different brains. This is a, a writer's brain. I'm actually gonna go ahead and go to a legal brain. This particular brain is all about criminal justice and state law. So clicking on this thought, again, we can go into federal courts and start navigating different uh, areas of the US Supreme Court. I can actually go ahead and link to relevant information here. So here we have a link to the web page. And um, if I've got certain uh, precedents that are related to a case that I'm working on, I can go ahead and make a connection to maybe a uh, defense project that I'm working on. So in building this knowledge base, you not only get to sort of capture what you know, but you get to leverage what you know for future projects. So here I might be looking at different um, areas or researching forensic psychology. Um, and all that can be organized nicely in the brain. So whether, it, whether it's an idea, a note, or a document, it all comes together. Uh, another example is that we do a lot of work in science. And um, so in this particular area, there is a, a brain on the role of longe uh, genetics in longevity. So you can kind of see uh, this particular brain was created uh, 100 percent by AI. And I can actually change the view. So if I want to go to mind map view and see a little bit more of this, I can go ahead and look at 
uh, mitochondrial function and DNA for lifespans. I can come in here and, and blow out the genetics area of this. And uh, what it really enables me to do is give me a nice overview of the content. Um, so in this case, I'm looking at the structure of my knowledge in a way that really helps me gain a broader understanding or overall gestalt of that information. And that does two things. It helps foster and deepen my understanding of things, but it also gives me a little bit of uh, relief in kind of giving me the big picture. This can also be done on a corporate level for um, HR policies, companies growing by merger and acquisition, as well as um, viewing your competitive landscape. So this uh, view of content can really become very a very powerful source for gaining insight and gaining knowledge. And then before I get into my teaching and learning brain, I also want to show you more of a corporate brain where your uh, research, research brain doesn't have to be a specific brain. It can be embedded in you know your your overall company brain so for instance this particular brain uh is a, is a life fitness company and they've got their active projects going on um they're starting a they had a women's lifestyle campaign but one of the nice things about any piece, one piece of information is you've got these cross categories coming in so this particular uh, article is related to some research they're doing on generation z in their market research area in marketing. So whether you're embedding a research section in a brain that is being shared with your company or you're diving into deep research on genetics, um, building a brain and sharing that information really enables a powerful level of insight that just isn't possible looking at these types of uh, information relationships and deep research topics through a file folder list, or even just like a hierarchy on a web page. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna go into my teaching and learning brain, and uh, I'm gonna change the view again. I've got my distant thoughts showing, so you can kind of get a sense of the breadth of this brain, but I actually prefer sort of my standard mode here. So I'm gonna go into topics and click on learning about. And from here, I might wanna go into my science area and I can create an, any new thought on anything I want. So if I wanna talk about or think about my new science lessons that I'm planning, I can come in here and make a connection. And maybe I wanna talk about some of my lessons might include genetics. And one of the things that you'll notice is I just type in the first couple letters of genetics and everything that is related to genetics uh, appears. So the brain is actually facilitating a discovery of information that would otherwise be overlooked. So in this case, there was an interesting article on uh, uh, genetics from Medli Medline Plus Research. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a connection rather than recreating the wheel on that. And you know, I can continue to add, if I wanna also do some research on diabetes, again, I could just type in the first couple letters and uh, there's a couple different interesting things. I'm really interested in meal planning. Um, that's also gonna be part of my lessons. I'm gonna make a connection there and uh, go ahead and add that into my brain. And, uh, and you can also create new thoughts by clicking the return as well. So if you uh, have, you know, make a mistake, and want to change things, that's pretty easy to do as well. So I've just hit the control button to get rid of a couple of these thoughts. And now I'm actually going to uh, go ahead and forget those just to clean things up. And I can move things around. If this biology lesson on health belongs in my new science lesson, I can go ahead and move that. And I can grow this brain and even add icons to my knowledge or thought types. So I'm going to come in here and set an icon and uh, just add this new icon to my science lessons. I can also create a thought type or tag for my knowledge as well. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in other areas. But uh, maybe this is a new horizon of focus for me. Um, this is going to be a good resource. These are all the key thought types that I have in this brain. In this case, I'm going to set this up as my a horizon of focus for myself, something I'm actually focusing on and, and pin this to the top of my brain as well. So 
So um, now what I want to do is actually show you, I've shown you how to create thoughts manually. Uh, what I want to do is create a new thought here. And my new thought is going to be called longevity. I'm very interested in longevity research. I'm just going to go ahead and create that thought. And now from there, rather than um, building my knowledge from scratch, I'm actually going to use the brain's AI to generate an automatic taxonomy for me so I can really start creating a nice broad category of knowledge on everything to do with longevity research. I want some ideas. So in this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, create a category on longevity. So there's a couple things. If I wanna do list, I can get more specific listings of things on longevity. In this case, I just wanna do a broad base of categories. Um, maybe I wanna cover people, uh, that are big in the longevity space. Uh, let's just put leading thinkers in longevity space today. And like with any AI, you, you, you kind of do need to play with this. In this case, I'm going to create child thoughts downward. So I just get a nice base structure. And what the brain's doing is it's actually adding all this information in my brain. And you can see I've got, um, it's got some categories for me that I can continue to build. So there's thought leaders and health span. There's um, different bio engineering people. There's <laughs> authorities on uh, cellular science. There's all kinds of things. But if I want to redo this, and I want to talk about leading thinkers in maybe um, longevity and let me say biohackers. I can come in and play and I'm just going to add people. So I'm just going to build my knowledge. And from there, I'm going to select to do a list view to get a little bit more specific thoughts and create those child thoughts. And let's go ahead and look at that list. And that actually looks pretty good. I'm quite satisfied with this base category, category structure that it's just built. So I'm gonna actually accept this. And now I can continue to build this. So in terms of diet and nutrition uh, for longevity, I can come over here and continue to build this area out. I might wanna focus on this. So let me just say, key nutrition research. And notice what I'm doing here is I'm actually expanding the query of AI without expanding my thought name. That's why the thought name won't necessarily change. I like that shorter thought name, but I actually want the query out to the brain's AI to be a little bit longer. And in this case, again, I'm going to go with categories to get a bit more specific. I actually might want to use the uh, set the parent context thought. The context thought here could be science. It could be anything else. It could also be longevity. And I'm going to go ahead and create that child thought structure here. And this looks pretty good, actually. Um, I could I could spend a lot of time. I love that it. it's got my blue zone diet. It's got stuff on protein in, intake and aging and all this information. So I'm actually going to go ahead and accept this. And you can see that I've got a nice area on diet and nutrition for longevity that I can continue to grow. And I can also relate this to uh, my diabetes research. So I'm going to go ahead and make a connection. Um, to that particular topic in my brain. And there we go. So now I've got all that. Um, and I can continue to grow this. I can add a note. So I'm just going to move my webcams over here. So if I want to automatically generate a note, I can do that as well. So I've got diet and nutrition for longevity. I can go ahead and select to generate a note. Now, what's really cool 
is I can actually tell the AI of the brain to use the children for context. So all, since I really like these categories, the AI of the brain can hone in on just specifically giving me a note that relates to the categories below. I absolutely love adding that in. Uh, that's a nice little trick. And you can adjust your word count. Um, so if you don't want a very long note, on this, um, obviously you can add your own ideas in as well. But in this case, just to kind of give you a sense of what a more fleshy built out brain, uh, brain note would look like, I'm gonna use AI to generate it and I'm gonna generate that note. And now you can see we've got all a nice little summary of all these different areas that I'm focusing on. And the other thing that's really cool is if I right click on any of these areas, I can actually go ahead and move to that area in my brain. So if I wanna activate plant-based plant diets from notes, I can go ahead and do that as well. So we've got connections already made. Oops, but before I do that, I'm sorry, I've got to accept the note, getting a little ahead of myself here. So I've created a great note, um, AI, um, and uh, we'll get into a little bit more into this in Matt's segment. It'll be a good segue um, for Matt to jump in in just a bit here. But um, I've accepted this. I don't have, I could have refined it if maybe I didn't want quite this long list. And in this case, I like it. But what you'll notice is there's little uh, dotted lines on the areas of the notes. And those lines, if I right click on those lines, it's actually linking back to the thought. So um, if I want to now activate that thought on plant based diets, it's going to move to that area and I can continue to build things on like maybe I want to create something on vegan uh, choice, vegan prepared meals. So it's kind of it's kind of cool the way uh, the AI will then go in and reconnect back with the visual interplace, the plex in the brain. But I think that's a good segue um, to maybe passing presenter over to you, Matt, so that you can dive a little further into um, even how smarter the notes are than what I've shown, I guess. <laughs> yeah, great segue, you know, into smart notes. What are smart notes? Um, we can all take a note. We could grab a piece of paper and jot something down. We can, um, you know, open up a, a Word document or notepad and, and start taking a note. We actually have a brain on the topic of note taking uh, that dives. And this is one of those brains that's going to be publicly available to anyone that's interested uh, that dives into sort of five, you know, tried and true proven methodologies, starting out with simplicity of the sentence method. What is the sentence method? Well, you have a subject and you can see I can click down through my structure. Uh, there's a video on taking notes using the sentence method. So if you're just heading back to college, or going to school and you want to uh, really step up your game this year and and uh, find a better way to take notes. This is a great brain for you to go through and find what works best for your thought process. Um, the sentence method you, method, you simply write down the subject and you write down 10 facts about that information and you continue to do that for every subject under a particular topic. Um, and there's an example for each of these five methods. So uh, this one is the subject of um, uh, the Concord. So 10 facts about the Concord. Um, great. Very, very easy process. You could take that a little further and go into the outline method. And the outline method uh, starts breaking things down just a little bit further. So you've got detail one, sub detail, sub sub detail, and so forth. And of course, there's an example here as well, um, all about Edgar Allan Poe. So you're you're refining your information beyond just sentences, subcategories, and that takes us to Cornell Notes. Cornell Notes, um, Cornell University developed a system. There's a whole website all about Cornell Notes. It's tried and true. There's videos here available for you, screenshots of existing Cornell Notes, and my own examples. And a Cornell Note starts going into tables. Uh, so you've got a queue. And then you've got notes on those different cues and you summarize. So collectively, what do you think about that information? So your notes start guiding you down in a collective way, guide you down to a final decision. So example number one, uh, should we uh, de-extinct the Tasmanian tiger? So the recall questions about uh, the topic, the notes 
the findings or studies, what have you. And in the end, the summary evidence would benefit that reintroducing the Tasmanian tiger to its native habitat would be beneficial um, if it can be done. And of course, we study that in the note as well. And it goes all the way down to, let's just finalize this with the mind mapping method. What does a mind map look like? We're in one right now. <laughs> We're clicking through a mind map. And the beautiful thing is what Shelly has already shown us is, um, you know, if you have a particular topic you're studying, you've got subtopics or what we call child thoughts down below. Sometimes those those findings, that information, a document, a, a, a note, what have you, it's related to other topics elsewhere in the mind map, or in this case, in your brain. Um, so you can see those cross-references. So again, this is a really, really great brain for just the the topic of of taking notes um, and and getting you, you know, like improving your uh, skill set with the, the process of note-taking. But again, smart notes. What is a smart note? A note that actually helps you to discover information that maybe you already know. You know, sometimes your notes can be fill up entire uh, notebooks or just pages and pages of documents. I'm jumping over to another brain now. Um, this is my Shakespeare brain. I'm a bit of a Shakespeare nut. Um, this brain contains the complete works of Shakespeare, but not just that. Um, I also have just my own insights. If I go into literature, for example, and I go into Shakespearean comedies, you know, I really love A Midsummer Night's Dream. Midsummer Night's Dream, when was it written? It, it's um, when he was working for the Lord Chamberlain. Uh, it falls under one of my favorites. I've got all my favorites mapped out, whether it's a favorite character, a favorite play, a favorite location, the Globe Theater, the Rose, or what have you, um, or even movies based on these uh, plays and, and additional information down below. Okay, great. Another area of this brain, however, is where I keep track of Shakespearean resources. Um, so information about the Elizabethan era, his own personal timeline of, of his life. Shakespeare in the news, he was uh, just a genius at insulting people. Uh, so I've got to insult generators. Uh, there's many of them out there online. And I have my own dictionary. When I am reading a play and I get to a word that I don't quite understand, and I'll just select a random letter here. I get to a word that I don't understand. Um, I make a note of it. Uh, I take the time to make a note of it in case it appears again, and I can refer back to that information and I don't have to relearn what I already know. Um, so I'm just gonna pick a word that really doesn't make a lot of sense right here, Jessus. I have no idea what Jessus is, but I took a note on it earlier. Jessus is a foot strap, which attached to the legs of a hawk. Uh, to the fist. Okay, so it's the strings on a hawk's feet that you hold on to so it doesn't fly away. And as I can see down below, these are my unlinked mentions. So anytime I have a note that mentions Jessus, um, I'm going to be able to get from that note over to this thought and vice versa. So I can see that Shakespeare used Jessus in Othello, uh, though that her Jessus were my dear heartstrings. Suddenly, I understand what that means. If I hadn't looked up Jessus, that would make no sense to me whatsoever. But I'm I'm understanding that he wishes that a lady thought of or held on to his heart the way one holds on to a hawk to not let it go. So it's just a, a, a meaning of affection. So that's just fantastic. And I can go straight over to Othello to read through and and uh, you know find. Uh, find that reference or or move on to the next one. And as you can see, as Shelly shared with us, anytime you type a word that is the name of another thought in your brain, I can right click, I can create a permanent link, or I can just activate it. What does bombast mean? And I can go to bombast and um, uh, it's actually cotton padding. I didn't know this, but it's gonna clarify all this information. And as you can see, he used that word quite a few times in many of his different plays. So you learn it once and you retain that information. I'm going to go back to Jay's and just pick one more example. Uh, jaded, for example, we all know what jaded means. Uh, it's you, when you're jaded, you're just sort of overworked, you're worn out, you're tired. And Shakespeare used jaded three different times. If I happen to add this, 
the brain will automatically create that backlink. And then I have the choice to, or excuse me, not a backlink. It will automatically create the unlinked mention. And then I have a choice to turn it into a backlink. So I'm just going to jump over to a Midsummer Night's Dream. I've got my technical studies, character studies down below. Um, there's sort of a lover's triangle. It's more of a square. Uh, Hermia loves Lysander. Lysander loves Helena. And Helena loves Demetrius. Um, this is really great. This is a feature in the brain as well. You can actually label your links between thoughts. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that today, but it really, really does add a lot of clarity. You know why two thoughts are connected. It's not just a subcategory. You know the relationship. So that's helping with smart notes as well, smart relationships um, and classifications of your information. But if I happen to type in, I think I was in the process of saying uh, Lysander uh, is a happy-go-lucky uh, personality that is not jaded by work or hard labor. Notice the blue words that are being underlined. Anytime a, a thought or excuse me, a, a word, some text is underlined in blue, that is an unlinked mention. That means I have information about that thought elsewhere in my brain. And when you're using AI and it's auto-generating, you saw Shelly generate a long, long note all of those references can be found automatically in the brain. And so you can link to existing information. The brain is going to help you to better classify all of the data that you're collecting. And of course, I can right click on jaded. If I want to create a permanent link, so a backlink, I can do that. In this case, I'm just going to activate. We'll go to jaded and we'll see that our... Um, we've increased our unlinked mentions because Jaded is now being mentioned on the Lysander thought as well. So those are unlinked uh, mentions and backlinks, a really, really valuable tool to help you um, uh, uh, turn your notes into smart notes for sure. Um, so the next example that I want to, uh, that I want to share with you, I'm going to jump into another brain. And uh, the brain that I wanted to open is uh, another sample brain that I've created for uh, for doing research. Um, a lot of times when we're doing research, we do, do research in many, many different ways, uh, whether we're taking notes, collecting files, collecting data. I'm going to focus on, on note taking since you know the subject of, of today is smart notes. And here I have some notes on. Uh, so this is a, a fictitious uh, biotech company. You can see Liforex is uh, one of our company medications, a product that we distribute. Uh, it's under clinical trials for atrial fibrillation. It's FDA approved for coronary artery disease. So again, my links are helping me to better understand the information that I'm looking at. I have links to people. So I have an expert on this particular product. I also have someone that works in my office that takes Liforex. So Two people, their relationship with this product is completely different. One is simply educated on the product because of the label information. The other has real world experience and doesn't mind sharing it with the team so we can get real honest feedback. Do you ever have trouble sleeping at night? Uh, does it, uh, you know, give you a headache? Are there side effects? You know, we can we can really tap into the really valuable resource there. So I'm taking notes on Liferex 3.0, and we're going through new clinical trials for this new advancement in the product. And this has been going on for some time, and you can see I have a lot of notes. I'm about ready to step into a meeting to talk about our progress, where we are, where we're headed. And if I were to just go through each one of these, well, in phase one, and start reading through this long note, that would be quite tedious. I need to summarize all of this information and quickly. Now, I could summarize each one one at a time, but I want to share multiple features with you at one time. I am going to control click on clinical trial one, two, and three. And control clicking adds content, adds thoughts into your selection box. There's a lot that you can do with it from there. I can right click and I can turn this into a document, a PDF 
with all the notes and information in a PDF that I can hand out in my meeting. But again, it's too much information. I need to summarize this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to merge these three thoughts. It takes all three thoughts, clinical trial one, two, and three. I have retained everything. I haven't lost any information. You can see that happened really quickly. The thought name is now clinical trial one, two, and three, and we don't need to worry about the different phases. It's just clinical trials. Okay, so these are my clinical trials for Liferex. There is phase four that hasn't happened yet. We'll get to that in a moment. All my notes are there. It merged my notes in the order that I selected those thoughts. One, phase one, phase two, and phase three. Once again, I'm now time is ticking. I got five minutes to get to my meeting. I am going to take this note and I'm gonna click on AI and ask it to simply summarize this content. One, two, and three, going from 10 pages of data to it looks like it, it put about each individual item on about half a page. So I've got about a page and a half to print out here. Um, I can accept these changes, redo or discard this data. It's fantastic. This is all I need. So I'm going to accept that and take that with me into the meeting. In fact, I'll uh, just create another uh, break there. So I know that this is my summary. That's where I'm starting with my meeting. And it just summarized everything so nicely. There is a lot that you can do with notes and the brain's AI integration. I can reorganize notes that have been jumbled over time. Um, I can rewrite them in a specific uh, pattern or style. I want to share with you the example of when I have a note that is really just like a bunch of chicken scratches. I just write a bullet point and, you know, phase four is still in planning mode. It hasn't happened yet. And I'm just kind of visualizing how it's going to work, how it's all going to come together. If I find something, um, health economics, that's what's that's what we're going to focus on in today's meeting. I'm just going to give this a little space and analyze, analyze the cost effectiveness is what we're going to do and evaluate the impact on healthcare resource utilization. Okay, great. What does that really mean? I am going to select... You can see I like to just do three dashes and it adds a line just to sort of highlight a particular area of a very large note. I am going to select this content. And again, I click on AI. And in this case, I want AI to expand. It's going to take the existing data and expand it. Now I've got some really great content for the meeting I'm about walk to walk into. So I've just shared with you two sort of opposite effects both with benefits that are needed at the time. Number one, I needed to take a 20-page document and turn it into a three-page document. Summarized, done. In this case, I took two sentences and turned it into a really in-depth review of this uh, this content. So health economics, I've got a lot of lot to talk about. It really opened up this subject and, and gave me some, some data that I can use moving forward. And of course, I can accept this. I can redo it. This is what I really like. Sometimes when I'm modifying some data, I can view what was changed. It sort of took out this one sentence and turned it into a paragraph, and it took off health economics and really broke down the um, all of that for you. So the green is the new content, and red is what was deleted. Two sentences gone, a whole page of, of data created, and that's exactly what I wanted. So I'll accept that change as well. So, um, and again, a lot that you can do there with the um, um, with that uh, that AI in existing notes of the brain. Um, the and Shelley actually showed you creating a note from scratch. I had that on my on my notes here. I keep my notes in another brain on another monitor. Um, so I'm going to jump ahead to another topic, and this topic came up. Um, and John, if you're on the call, I was speaking to a. a, a customer, a fellow named John last this week that was going to attend the meeting and said, hey, my data, my research needs to be structured. It always needs to follow the same process. I can't just go to a new project I'm working on and start typing up some ideas. It needs to follow phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. Are there any type of templates that you can create? Um, and yes, you can create your own templates. 
Um, you know, there's no one template fits all for all types of research in the world. So you can create a template and use that for structured data again and again over time. So I have another brain that, uh, that I've created. And this, this is simply called my template brain. And I've got a, a sort of a, a collection of different styles of templates. I'm gonna go down into my investment template. So let's say I'm investing. Uh, what am I investing in? Well, I'm investing in the stock market, but it changes. And, and I do a lot of research when I invest in, in something in the stock market. I wanna know about the company. What's their ticker so I can look them up? What's their one year history? What's their track, year, track record over two years? Or maybe I even wanna change this. So I'm always looking at the five year overview of a company versus the one year or what have you. And um, I keep track of what my risk, I've got notes about what my risks are on my peer review. You know, I ask certain people, I know other people that are investors, I trust their opinion, um, or I find their opinion to be, you know, uh, insightful, or in some cases, maybe, you know, at Nerd Wallet, I usually go the opposite way. If, if they're saying, okay, invest in cryptocurrency, I'm going to go, hmm. Not today, nerd wallet. So I want to know all of these different places and, and keep their notes. And I want to do this every single time for every single investment I make so that I create a, a, a structured review of my data over that's consistent over time. Okay, so I am going to control click on company X and control click on the gate to select all of its child dots. Also, if this was multiple generations down, you could go up to edit and select related thoughts and say, all right, select all child thoughts for 11 generations. If you really have a, a giant web of information that you're regenerating. In this case, I'm just simply one level deep. This is all I need. I'm going to right click and I'm going to copy these seven thoughts. Now I am going to take us into my uh, investment brain, the brain that I, it's again, is a sample brain, uh, my digital brain. And here's my portfolio. So um, these are companies that I am currently invested in and I can review their track record and keep notes and, and how much I have and when I'm thinking about selling and so forth. Um, I've got notes on how to create a stable stock portfolio, as well as one that's very diversified. So I keep a lot of notes there. And here's where we're focused today, whoops, on research. So these are companies that I am not invested in, but they're on my radar. I'm, I'm keeping an eye out for them. And so I've got a few new companies that I'm interested in. One is Citigroup. I've heard murmurs that it's a really great time to invest in Citigroup. Okay, I've got that information on my clipboard, remember. I'm going to paste those seven thoughts. Now, I've done this in this brain before, so it wants to know if I want to replace those seven thoughts, copy them, or skip them. And I can even expand this. Very, very helpful. And this is, allows you to take sections of brains and copy them into other brains. That's exactly what we're doing here. So yes, I do want to create a new copy of all these. So it creates company X with all my information down below. But I'm not investing in company X, I'm investing in Citigroup. So I'm going to change the name of company X to Citigroup, uh, whatever it is, Inc. or LLC, I'll say Inc. And hit enter. Now the child thoughts down below were utilized with the comma trick. The comma trick is great for adding clarity to very commonly named thoughts. I don't want dozens of thoughts in my brain called risk. I want to know that it's Kraft Heinz risk, Spotify risk, top build risk, in this case, Citigroup risk. Um, so yes, I do want to change those. And did I, let's control Z. There we go. I'll do that one more time. I think I lost my opportunity to rename. So I just rolled back real quickly. Company Z is Citigroup. I'll just name it that. Do I want to rename the uh, child thoughts down below? Yes, I do. Rename. So now I have Citigroup risk, Citigroup peer review, Citigroup uh, market position, and so forth. And I can do it again and again with more companies. I'll paste those seven thoughts. And I've got another group. I can right click and paste again. I've got two more companies that I'm knowing I know of. There they are. This one is not called Company X. It's Tapestry. And yes, rename its child thoughts. 
And there's my other one. So uh, the comma trick is just a really, really great uh, subtle feature within the brain, but again, allows you to add clarity. It's actually the technical term is context sensitive naming. Uh, we'll rename this to a company called Toast that I'm taking a look at, it's sort of a restaurant company. There we go. So I've got all of my, uh, again, every investment that I'm researching is going to follow the same process, the same pattern. That's going to be really, really helpful for me to over time to keep all of that information, um, you know, aligned and, and uh, tight in, in regards to its formation. It's always going to follow the same process and I'm never going to miss a step in a rigorous process that I follow with my research. And then finally, uh, the last component that I wanted to share with you is once again, we can sync all of this information to the brain cloud. So I can click on sync and I can access this information anywhere I go. I think this is kind of an important component of smart notes. Um, it's, they're always with you. They're always accessible. Um, if you have an application or if you're taking notes on pen and paper, um, old school, there's no school like the old school, that's great, but you have to have that notebook with you when you show up for class, when you go to your meeting, uh, when you're traveling and, and inspiration hits at a moment. You need to be able to capture those thoughts, refine your notes, edit them, and by syncing your brain to the cloud, you can take your brains with you, all of your data, anywhere you go. So I click on, uh, I've already done that, I clicked on sync, all of this information is available online. Uh, let's take a look at it online. Maybe I'm logging in from my kid's um, uh, Chrome, Chromebook or a Linux machine or, or my wife's laptop. She doesn't have the brain installed, but yet I need to look up that phone number for a client that I'm working with. I can, I'm gonna open this in the web client. So we go out to app.thebrain.com and log in with your credentials. It's absolutely safe and secure. You're the only one that has your password for your brain account. Therefore, you're the only one with access to that data, unless you choose to share that data. And that sort of uh, is the bridge to uh, the next topic that I want to talk about really quickly. But here you can see I'm actually in my web browser. I'm right there on the research thought. If I'm Starting my research on Toast, I don't have my laptop with me. I can get online and I'm not sure what the, whoops, what the ticker is for Toast. Um, T-O-A, we'll just make it up. Where's the company's located, their background website. I can just start taking all of my notes, adding all of this information. And next time I you know, get back to my laptop, what am I gonna do? I'm going to, let's go ahead and close this. So I added just that ticker information, TOA for toast, but the brain will sync in the background every three to five minutes. I'll just do a manual sync. Any changes that happen on another device, my iPhone, my iPad, um, or when I was on the cloud, and there you can see it. That TOA that I added through the web client has now been downloaded and is accessible from my desktop uh, brain as well. So it's accessible everywhere I go. Now, I mentioned if you want to share that information, there's so many different ways to share a brain. And we actually have entire webinars all about collaboration. But very, very quickly, I'll share with you that, um, you know, uh, Shelly was in a brain earlier. Um, and I believe it was Life Fitness Company. There it is. So this is a brain that, that uh, Shelly actually had open earlier, you might recall. I have access to this brain as well. We actually uh, collaborate in this brain. We're both editors. That is done with a team brain license. Uh, there are many different license types for the brain, whether you're on a standalone machine, you're syncing to the cloud and accessing from multiple devices, all the way up to collaboration. You're sharing and have multiple editors in the same brain. So both Shelly and I can modify this brain. If we ever wanna see who made a change and when, each individual thought has its own history. So I can see when Shelly changed some content on the notes, when I did, if I scroll back, I can even find additional users that have, uh, have logged in and modified this data what they changed, when the change, these changes go all the way back to 2018, as you can see, 
Or I can just click on the little icon in here. Let's sync. I think Shelly may have uh, it probably already synced in the background. There you can see Shelly added that product design research. So I've been out of the office for a while. What changes have happened recently? Oh, Shelly today modified product design research. So I can go to that thought and look up the content that she's added. If I want to look at changes over you know, the past week, the past month, the past 365 days, who made changes and when, it's all going to be accessible through TeamBrain. And to share this, uh, again, it's an upgrade in your license type to Team Brain, and then once you have Team Brain set up um, on any of your existing brains, you can start collaborating. So I can go into my brain access and sharing, and I can see who has access to this brain, what their access level is. I can give some people read-only access to the brain. If they need the data, but I don't want them editing it, read-only mode. I can also give this brain public access and therefore anyone with the URL. This is a sample brain, so we're happy to share this brain. It's um, uh, a fictitious company with, with uh, data that we've put in. Um, but anyone can go to that URL then, since I have made it publicly accessible, and see this brain online. And that means they don't even need to have the brain installed. My clients, my customers uh, want to know what the progress is on the research that I'm doing for them or the project. I can share this brain with them as a read-only user. They don't even need to know the brain existed. I just gave, send them that URL and they'll be able to click through and navigate uh, through a brain that I've put together. So as I've said, many different ways to uh, collaborate and share a brain database. And Shelly, I think that wraps up all of the different features that I wanted to share. We've got about 10 minutes before the end of the hour. Uh, so now's a great time for questions. If anyone did have a specific question, now's the time to enter that into the, uh, the Zoom question and answer panel. We do have a question on search, how you mm -hmm. search across multiple brains and index all your files. Great, yes. Um, the search in brain, the Brain 14 has been uh, vastly improved. It's fantastic. Cross-brain searching. So when I do one search, I'm not only searching for data in this brain, I'm searching through data in any brain that I have access to. So I'm in the wrong brain right now for LifeRx, but LifeRx 3.0 is on my mind. I was recently working on that project. And if I do a search in this brain for life, um, yes, I've got Life Fitness, uh, Women's Summer Lifestyle Campaign. Uh, here are all my notes. So I'm searching through PDF attachments, uh, files, documents, and, and notes. And down below are thoughts and links from other brains. So I can scroll down and find all of these, the, the instances of the word life in all of my different brains. And if I go down even further, you can see it's still building 963 matches. Here's all of my notes on that contain the word life in the document or in the note. And if I say, let's truncate this a little, Liforex. Um, and maybe it is actually spelled wrong, spelled differently. Let's just say life then. Um, and we'll just go to another brain. So I can scroll down and find LB architecture, early life. So I can get to another brain, isn't even open, but it's gonna take me directly to the early life of Banksy, some research that I'm doing in Banksy in this particular brain. So just a really, really great feature that uh, search is not only looking through all the text-based data in this brain, your notes, your attachments, uh, your thoughts, but in other brains that you have access to as well. All right, great. And Connie had a question about how to label thoughts. So maybe we could cover labeling thoughts, thought types, tags, and link types, because there's a number of different labels to make the information more granular and add yes. that semantic meaning. Um, she specifically asked about the thought labels, but kind yeah. of in that genre of um, tagging information as well. Sure. If you alt click on a thought or click on the current active thought, you're going to open up the thought properties display. And you may have seen Shelly and I do this a, a couple of times uh, today. This is where you can modify the thoughts, sort of the look and feel. You can color code it. You want it to stand out. You can apply an icon. Icon is a nice little visual cue of, um, you know, for 
whatever symbolizes that particular topic, you can utilize that or change the color code. It's really great because it also makes a thought stand out from time to time. Um, you know, thought types can be made of certain colors. So anytime a thought has this sort of light pink text, I know that that is a medical condition. It picks up the thought label. So let's talk about thought labels. Thoughts themselves can have their own unique label. If I just want to be reminded every time, oh, that's why I couldn't find life erects. There's no E. I was spelling it wrong. Um, but if any time I wanted to uh, come down to life erects and just simply be reminded that this is, uh, you know, my top priority, top priority, I can add that label. So when you hover over a thought, you see the label. Labels are indexed, so therefore they're searchable as well. If I do a search for what's my top priority, I'm going to find the life Rex thought. So individual labels on thoughts, but labels are also very helpful for, for many different reasons. You can use labels for acronyms or synonyms, um, or if I just want a list of customers that I know are interested in this product, once it becomes available, I can say, all right, customer... Customer A, customer B, customer C. So I'm just reminded, these are the people that are waiting. Uh, that's very helpful as well. But also labels can be added to thought types. And uh, Liferex is um, a medication. And that is, medication is actually what I have just on the individual label. But that is a medical, it's a medication that can be used for a medical condition. Um, and those are some of my different thought types that I have in this brain, medical conditions, medications, and so forth. So those are classifications of thoughts. Uh, thought types are like a general category that a thought falls might fall into. Is it a medication? Is it a competitor medication? So I can see ACE and Zoran are competitor medications. Um, but then also sometimes they have tags. This is a high priority. Uh, this medication just came out. Um, it's with one of our competitors. It's very successful. We need to look into this to see if we can sort of answer the call for our clients or what have you. Um, so you can add these different attributes using a thought tag. And the great thing about thought tags is you can have multiple thought tags on a thought. So this is a real sort of high level overview of all the different ways to label and classify your thoughts. You don't have to use them all. You can use the ones that work best for you. I like thought labels. I like thought types, thought tags, whatever works best. Thought tags are great, though, like I said, I can have multiple thought tags. So ACE is a high priority that we research it. Uh, Shelly has a lot of work to do on this particular thought. She's also working on labels for other products. And now I'm going to assign, so I click and I add another tag. I want Shelly to review this and get on board. And I want it to be available uh, in France for our customers in France. So now three tags on this thought, a product that we need to get a competitive product out for in France. Shelly has to start doing her research and assign tasks to the team. And this is currently a high priority. And notice that your tags can have icons as well. Also very helpful. Uh, right, so that's yeah. a sort of a, we could have a whole webinar, yes. I think, Shelly, on, on thought types and tags. Thought that's types, a very tags. high level overview. Yeah. yeah. And and I guess the, the easiest way to remember the difference too with a thought type, you can have one type per thought that gives you that overall icon and color and tags, mm -hmm. multiple tags, labels. Um, that's a little bit more uh, multidimensional right. uh, attributes to your thought, if you will. Yeah. And Lauren had a question about sharing. Can you share a brain URL without notes? And how do you print the output of a brain? So first of all, sure. in terms of sharing, just real quick, um, sharing publicly just for read-only read users is just great for, I know we have some teachers and educators on this call. So um, feel free to, you know, create a great curriculum, share your knowledge, and then just literally hit share to cloud and send that URL to your students. But that being said, once you share the thought, the notes do come. However, Lauren, you can set the entire thought to be private. So um, Jerry Mikulski, who's probably um, our, one of our legendary uh, publishers, um, we can we might want to send everyone's link, everyone a link to that brain. 
um, to kind of got everything from the last 20 years that he's been thinking about in that brain. And uh, it's all made public. You don't need any kind of software and the search works great across the brain. You can traverse and discover content. But he also has private thoughts in his brain that you won't be seeing when you look at that brain. So um, just real quick, Matt, I guess I guess you're already yeah. on the area here um, to prepare your brain and all these uh, amazing educators for publishing to their students, to their peers. Um, we'll, we'll cover a little bit about uh, private thoughts. Yeah, private thoughts are great if you are going to share the URL for your brain. If you're in a team brain environment and people have local copies of this brain, um, they're still going to see the private thoughts. So private thoughts are uniquely for people with only the URL so they can get to this brain online. I don't want, I, I want my whole team to know all about this brain, but there's just a small group of us that are working on this, you know, our competitor, competitive research. Uh, so I don't want them to be troubled with, with this thought, maybe, or all of its children. I'll control click and select its, it only has two child thoughts, but I can right click and I can make these private as well. So that is, there it is, select privacy, make private. So I've made these three thoughts private. I resync to the cloud. So right now my local brain knows those are three private thoughts. The cloud brain version that's on the cloud doesn't know it yet, now it does. And so now when I click on online, brain access and sharing, and I make this publicly accessible and send this URL, um, they're going to uh, be able to see, again, everything in this brain with the exception of these private thoughts. It won't show up in the search. The content of the notes won't so show up in the search. These thoughts are private. Only myself, Brigitte, Harlan, and Shelly will be able to see those private thoughts, but not anyone visiting from the cloud. So that's the private thought feature. All right, great. And then actually, um, Connie was actually referring to your um, FDA approved label link types. And actually, Pedro also has a question. How do I label the edges between the thoughts? I think by that we're talking about the link types. You have some amazing yep. link types. So um, a moment, if you will, yes. on link types. Yes, and so, maybe even customizing the thickness and thinness of link, because there's oh, a sure. lot of customization with the links as well that we haven't got to. Sure, sure. So here you can see, um, you know, this is uh, this example that I'm using today is is all about uh, is a, a sample biomed brain. I am not personally in, uh, you know, bio uh, the the biomed um, industry. But we saw a brain once, I saw a brain once of a customer that that did use the brain specifically for this. And so I've basically recreated it, but changed all the names to be fictitious names. But it was absolutely amazing to see their use. And that's where I got the idea of this, of the link type. So here's medications that I'm researching. I'm interested in all of these different medications right now. And here is a medication, atrial, or here is a medical condition, excuse me, atrial fibrillation. Uh, it's FDA approved ACE, one of our competitors, non FDA approved diloxin currently going through clinical trials, Liforex. So there's three subcategories, but they all have completely don't just assume that because it's a subcategory that it, you know, these all cure or help with atrial fibrillation. No, one is under clinical trials. One is went through clinical trials and was not approved, um, not FDA approved, but one is FDA approved. So if I'm on the phone with a client, a distributor, whatever, if they're calling from the US, I can say, oh, you need to look at, at ACE, it's FDA approved. They're calling from Canada. I don't need to worry about FDA approval. You should probably check out Dialoxia uh, or what have you. So, um, you know, those link labels can provide additional context, additional clarity. How do you set those up? You can manually set them up. So if I double click on a link, I can manually add a label. Why does thought A connect to thought Z? Here's the reason. And I add the label. Or I can set up link types, types that are going to be used over and over and over again. So I can click on the little pencil down below. Um, I can click set up a new type if I've got a new product. And I'll just say X, Y, Z. Z, where's Z? 
there it is. X, Y, Z is actually the new type. And I can use that thought type. This is a sample brain, so I don't mind changing around these, this content. I can use that type over and over again. The benefit there is it makes it quick and easy. I've got a new, I'm just adding some gibberish, a new child thought. I double click on that label. What type is it? It's X, Y, Z, and I move on to the next. So I can apply these link labels over and over again. Here's the great thing. You can run a report in your brain and say, all right, I want you to show me all of the link types that are FDA approved, all thoughts that have an FDA approved link connecting to them. So these are all my different link types in the brain. And if I just want to look at, I'm just researching FDA approved relationships, uh, whether it's the parent, the child, the jump thought, what have you, these are all different link types. So uh, link types and link labels, a little bit different. Types are just simply used over and over again, but you can run reports against them as well. Now you asked about the edges of thoughts. Um, that's an excellent question. You're very observant. You'll notice that thought types have a rounded edge. So visually, I know this is not a thought. This is not a native thought. These are native thoughts down below, but they all fall under a thought type, which is they are an, a natural antioxidant. Those are thought types. So it has that rounded edge. A thought uh, tag has sort of a chamfered edge. Uh, the, the corners are cut off. So Shelly is a tag. A thought can be tagged uh, with Shelly. And so what really is great about tagging people, especially in a team brain environment, I can log into the brain and see if anyone has tagged a thought for me. Yes, they need me to do some personal research. I wasn't aware of this. They don't have to call me. I don't have to have a meeting. It's just a, a sort of best practice. Log in every morning and take a look at my tag, personal research for that I'm doing on omega-3 fatty acids and holistic heart health projects. Um, and when Shelly logs in, she'll see that she has the new task of reviewing what research we're doing, competitive research analysis for ACE. So those are the different edges around thoughts. They're just a visual cue as to uh, the, the nature of the thought, whether it's a type tag or a native thought. And one last thing I'll share with you, we're really, really downloading information here on today's webinar. This is another good one as well. Um, you can convert a thought to a type or tag. If you are just now learning about types and tags and you have people that you just have them as native thoughts and you say, oh no, that should be a tag. That'd be a great way to classify you know, the, the projects that my team is working on. Rather than a thought, they're just tagged with, they're working on these aspects of that project. Um, so in other words, if I said for this product, someone that knew a lot about this was Joe. Oops, I made him a native thought. I want Joe to be a tag. I'll make him a parent thought up above. Go to the Joe thought and uh, oops, I right click and I can convert to a type or tag. I'll make it a tag and say, okay has those chamfered edges now, and it shows down below, Joe. And then I want to connect Joe to, you can see I've got all my people grouped together and there's Joe kind of floating out there. Nope, I will connect Joe to people. There we go. And now Joe has been nested inside the group of people. And that's also great for, for reports. By nesting these, I can say, all right, show me all thoughts that are tagged with you know, people, it's going to show me thoughts that are tagged with Bill, Brigitte, Matt, Shelley, and so forth. Show me all thoughts that are tagged with Joe, and there'll only be this one thought. Um, so those are the uh, edges, thoughts, types, and tags, and the ability to convert thoughts to types, tags, or back to a native thought. All right, great. And just getting back to publishing, we had a couple users, um, one writing in about, is it possible to publish your brain behind a blog or a paywall? The answer is yes. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, Mark Trexler, one of our big thinkers on previous webinars has his brain, he has a portion free, he has another portion behind a paywall where you actually have to be a member of his climate research um, 
uh, group to see that brain. And then along those lines, um, Lauren was asking about um, if there's copyrighted material or attachment, is there some way to share some of that stuff without being shared? So this is where we're getting into a little bit of access levels, which mm -hmm. David had a question on too, that we're, we're going to get back to. But just in terms of what we've done, um, copyright materials, for instance, we actually, uh, one of our clients, Joint Council of Cardiothoracic Sur Surgery, you've probably seen our, uh, if you go to our Team Brain page, there's a video of actually Dr. B Craig Baker talking about this brain. That one was also done behind their company intranet. Um, so if you have um, links to different copyrighted materials, uh, what you might wanna think about doing is getting a Team Brain for your um, students or your faculty. And that way, uh, if that brain is on your server behind your firewall, um, it will automatically start to detect what uh, you know types of articles and information sources uh, your users can have. And then along those lines, if we wanna just go back to Team Brain and review just the levels of access, Matt, we had David, okay. and I'll read his question directly. Can you discuss levels of access that can or cannot be assigned to individuals to entire brains? Okay. So um, for instance, when Matt was in his brain on, um, I think it was the JT Apparel, Apparel Brain, mm -hmm. Um, Brigitte might have been a reader, um, somebody's an editor, you can have multiple administrators. So the nice thing about when you create a team brain, whether it's on our cloud or behind your firewall with our server software, is you can assign different levels of access and control. So you might want a smaller group, maybe a handful of uh, you know, your professors or researchers, maybe you've got 10 of those people who are actually creating the content. And in terms of your students, they're functioning in a read-only mode as well, and they're readers. So uh, in terms of the global settings um, for people, you can have a reader, administrator, or um, an editor. Yeah. And editors can actually contribute to the brain, but they can't change the fundamental structures or permissions um, or add other people. And admin, uh, yeah. there's so th so there's a lot of possibilities for divergent groups and divergent roles within one team brain. And here I wanted to share um, uh, the question about embedding a brain behind a paywall. Um, so if I, I'm on uh, the web client right now, so I'm on app.thebrain.com, logged into my account. I've got a brain called children's books. If I wanted to put you know, my children's books that are all in a brain, behind a paywall, I click on uh, brain access and sharing. And we have this wonderful, um, it's iframe code. If you are if you have some knowledge of HTML, iframe is a way to uh, take this content and embed it into a brain and on your own URL. So a person isn't going to app.thebrain.com, such as when you go to Jerry's brain uh, that Shelly mentioned earlier, you go to jerrysbrain.com and you'll see Jerry's brain. It's a brain embedded in his website. The URL right. is jerrysbrain.com. So you can play around with that, make it a certain size. If you know a little bit, a bit of HTML, you can really you know fiddle with it to make it fit in the right window or location or what have you. So that's how you get to that uh, embedding. Uh, of course, you do have to have your brain synced and it needs to be publicly accessible. Because if you embed a brain that is not uh, shared or not synced, number one, it's there is no there are no brain to go to on the cloud. It needs to be synced. It needs to be publicly accessible so that a person doesn't just see the login screen when it pops up in that window. Um, it just opens up, you know, once they get to that page and they can navigate through the brain. And then regarding the um, access levels. If I click on options and go back into, uh, or excuse me, on online brain access and sharing, um, you know, this is where you can see who's a reader, who's a writer, who's an administrator. If we want to upgrade Harlan, he's a reader, but he's been doing a great job lately. It's time for him to start editing this brain and contributing. Um, I simply right click. In order to be a writer or an administrator, uh, they need to have a team brain license. I need to have a team brain license. I also need to be an administrator of this brain. So only Shelly and I can say who has access to this brain and then what their access level is. Um, so you right click and these will be grayed out if this person only has a, you know, a pro license or 
uh, or even a pro combo license or a monthly subscription. They don't have team brain, so they can't be an editor of, of this particular brain. Um, and also when you give access to a brain, um, you're giving access to that entire brain. If you need to give them access to a segment, a smaller portion of a brain, that's when you need to decide whether you should have one brain with everything in it or smaller topic specific brains. So if I want to give someone access to this brain, but only to the competitive analysis area, I need to actually go to, and this question came up at the very beginning of today's call, um, how can we um, extract uh, portions of a brain into smaller topic specific brains? So here really quickly, control click, I add human longevity into my selection box. Now I click on edit and select related thoughts. And I'm gonna select, I'll go eight generations, just child word, I guess. We'll see what that adds. I now have 146 thoughts added. There's uh, eight generations down. There's a lot of data in this brain. This is all I want to you know, give to assign to a project for Shelly or something of that nature. I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna copy 146 thoughts and I'm gonna click on file, create brain. And I'll just call it new brain. I could call it human longevity or what have you. Uh, creates a new brain randomly selects one of my different themes or wallpapers. I can clearly modify that very easily, dark blue, light blue, but I still have all those thoughts on my clipboard. I'm gonna paste them and it pastes everything. It pastes the thought icons, uh, the notes that you have with that thought, those thoughts, the tags, the thought types and so forth. It's all in this particular brain. So I can see I've got, there's a new brain. I've got a new thought type. Uh, I've got some new thought tags that have already been created. Um, so all of that content on human longevity is here. I've segmented from my large primary brain, a smaller uh, section of a brain that I can then share with the appropriate person. And I'm not concerned about accidentally sharing some information they shouldn't have. I kept that over in my the primary brain, the earlier brain. Changing data in one brain does not go back and change it in the other. You've got two separate brains now. It's like taking a paragraph out of a Word document and pasting it into a new Word document. The two are not linked. Uh, so I've got two separate brains. Um, so moving forward, everything and uh, uh, regarding human longevity research, I'm going to be doing in this particular brain, collaborating with the appropriate people. All right, and I think we are well into overtime. So um, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Um, for those of you who have missed anything, there will be a recording automatically emailed to you. And I'm sorry if we didn't get to everyone's questions or some of the questions as far as importing research papers and things like that were a little more nuanced, but we do offer free support to uh, every user. So feel free to chat into the web our website or write to support and we'll be happy to dive in a little deeper on your individual needs. And we also have the Brain 101 every second Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific. Is yeah. one, do we have one this Friday, Matt? We certainly do, this oh, Friday. okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure right before the Labor Day weekend. Well, so if your schedule is looking, <laughs> looking clear, join Matt's class. Um, we have a lot more time to demo individual questions. You can sign up for that. Um, it's at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific uh, this Friday. Yeah. And uh, it's just a great resource, even if you hop in uh, the last 15 minutes of the class to get a specific question demoed. And I think with that, we've covered a lot of grounds. The one comment I did want to add is just how um, some of the brains that Matt showed us with the link types and the different color coding, how quickly that does really collapse the time to knowledge and execution. So when I was seeing all those drugs, I don't have to read a long paper or even a long note about whether it's approved or not approved because I look at it immediately and see that in the link. So that is so valuable um, you know, to use as a scripting tool if you're on a podcast or doing customer service or you just have a lot of information in your day. So um, really consider these ways of um, fine tuning and visualizing your information, not just with the links, but with the, the different colors and labels to really help you assimilate um, these complex and deep research topics. And I think with that, we're gonna close today's session. Matt, do you have any other final uh, words of wisdom uh, for our the attendees that are still uh, sticking it out. Well, thanks <laughs> Even though to we're everyone. 13 minutes yeah. 
uh, 16 minutes over the hour. And thank you. Thanks for all the great questions and participation, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining today. Again, Brain 101 this Friday, if anything today was a little bit over your head, uh, join us for uh, for 101. And uh, you can always reach out to us, support at thebrain.com. We're happy to hear from you. Oh, and sorry, real quick. I just have yeah. to let Charles know that, yes, um, you have a single search front function across multiple brains that came yes. in earlier. But again, um, and there was a question about JSON files um, that somebody had about importing that from that as well as folder directories. We have a great knowledge base um, mm -hmm. with links to these types of more in-depth technical um, aspects, as well as an API um, to, to go That's even right. further down that path. So again, um, just follow us on Twitter, join us for future events, and we'll try and keep you all posted. We've got some amazing new developments in the works, and we look forward to seeing you on future brain technology events. Thanks, everyone, and uh, have a great day and uh, hopefully a great year with your smart notes. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye.